had to get your attention. <laughs> no, I was paying attention. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Savannah. And I'm Alicia. This is Burden of Proof. Are you ready? I am. I'm excited for today. You've mentioned conspiracies, and I know nothing about this case, even though it feels like maybe I should. So, what are we so talking about today? Excited. Pamela Smart. Pamela Smart. Yeah, you, you said you don't know much about the case. Obviously, no. it happened before your time. I wasn't I was alive, thought. but I was a child. I just had heard about it. Actually, I think the first thing I ever heard about the case was there was a movie called, I think it's To Die For. Nicole Kidman was in it. Oh, I love Nicole Kidman. And it was based on this story, but it very much is loosely mm-hmm. based on this story. So, you know. Anyway, I saw that and then found out more about the case after, years ago. And I kind of forgot about it. And then as I was looking for a new case, boom, there it was. And I said, I'm going to do that. And then when I really dived in, I thought, maybe I don't want to do that. <laughs> but it's too late. I'm already head first. Okay. So I'm going to try to keep it to an hour. I did. I just didn't want to spend... There's been so much coverage on this case. I mean, you didn't hear it, so maybe some of our younger listeners haven't heard it. So I stuck with it, but definitely there is more information out there to be more nitty gritty details to be heard. The entire trial is available on CourtTV.com, I guess is there. (laughs) I don't know. If you type it in, it'll come up. Yes. If you type it in, it comes up and you can watch the entire entire trial because fun fact it was the first completely live broadcasted trial in u.s history wow yes i don't know what i thought that was i think i thought it was oj nope it was pamela smart Hmm. in all her glory do you know what year oj was yes i do i was 15 on vacation in Tennessee in my great uncle's house when OJ happened. It was right around my birthday. Um, so how old am I? <laughs> it was two. It was ninety-four. Okay. OJ. So this is okay. This is a little bit before. This okay. happened in nineteen ninety. Okay. So we're gonna start. Pam's maiden name was actually Pamela Ann Voyez. But it's spelled W-O-J-A-S. Okay. She was born on August 16th, 1967 in Wyndham, New Hampshire. The family moved to Miami, Florida, where they stayed until Pam was about in eighth grade. Uh, And then they moved back to New Hampshire to the small town of Derry. Pam attended high school at Pinkerton Academy in Derry before going on to graduate from Florida State University with a degree in communications. An FSU girly. Yes. Pam was a real overachiever. A straight-A student, a cheerleader, a host of a college radio program. I thought you were going to say she was a hoe. I don't know why. Genuinely thought Um, you were saying she was a cheerleader, she was a hoe. (laughs) I'm like, go off, queen. Well, some might say that (laughs) after you hear the whole story. Some might say that. She had dreams of becoming a reporter someday. But while on break in the winter of 1986, she goes home to visit over uh, her break from school. And she met Gregory Smart. They met at a mutual friend's party and instantly hit it off. Both Pam and Greg had an affinity for heavy metal music and partying. Unlike Pam, though, Greg really wasn't an overachiever. According to reports, he didn't really aspire to... He was just partying. Yeah. He didn't go to college. He just... He's just doing his thing. You do you, Greg. Despite that, Pam decided Greg was the one. She saw him. She talked to him. She said, you're the one. Dibs. And despite the distance, the relationship blossomed. Of course, it wasn't long before something had to give because long distance is difficult. And Greg moved to Florida to be with Pam. The couple remained in Florida until Pam graduated college. 
And then they returned to Derry, New Hampshire in 1988, where they got engaged to be married. Pam was hired by the local school district as the director of media, which mainly required her to focus on administrative and PR projects, but also opened the door to a mentorship program at Winnicunit High School. Greg had given up his wild ways and settled into a job selling insurance at the same agency as his father. On May 7th, 1989, Greg and Pam tied the knot in a beautiful traditional ceremony. The Greg and Pam's friends and family, they appeared like the perfect couple and were absolutely head over heels in love. Cute. But were they? I didn't think so, because of where we are. Would we be talking about them? Probably not. So, on the evening of May 1st, 1990, just shy of their wedding anniversary, Greg came home to what should have been a quiet home. Pam wasn't there. She had a meeting at work and would be late. But instead of coming home to a quiet house, Greg is attacked as soon as he walks in the door by two young men screaming at him and wrestling him to the ground, holding a knife to his throat. Whoa, what an escalation. In shock and not understanding what they want, he tells them to take whatever they want, and when they don't move, he begins asking why they're doing this. One of them screams at Greg to shut up and pulls a gun out of his jacket. The other grabs Greg to hold him still, and the gunman shoots Greg in the head point blank. Oh, my gosh. The neighbor in the condo next door had heard some scuffling, which he told police wasn't unusual, and minutes later, he heard what he thought was a door slamming. But he ignored it as he's used to it being noisy. Well, yeah, you live in a condo. You're kind of used to other hearing other people's noise. But yes. is a gunshot similar to a door slam? Well... The gunshot may have been a little muffled. Because it was point blank? And we'll get to that. Okay. The reason he ignored it was the Smarts were sort of known for having parties. Like, even though they had settled into their engaged and married life and whatever, they still, like, neighbors knew they still have parties. They suspected drug use, yada, yada. So I think that's why he ignored it. Is He's just Mm, like, oh, this crazy, crazy young couple next door. However, just after 10 p.m., the neighbors hear a woman pounding on the door screaming for help. The husband, who had heard the shuffling and bang earlier, told his wife to call 911, and he wait he waited until the commotion settled to open the door calmly and see what was going on. I'm laughing because in his court testimony... He even said, I looked around for a weapon. I, I grabbed my briefcase wow. to gra- to get something to take with me as I opened the door. Yeah. And he laughed at himself in the court testimony because he said he grabbed a- an umbrella. <laughs> oh. <laughs> a little like yeah. a little small umbrella out of his briefcase and walked out of the door like I'm ready, <laughs> ready to defend himself. Oh, but that's kind of Because they didn't know, again, they didn't know what was going on, and they're used to there being, like, partying and craziness and a little bit. I mean, I don't know that it was, like, horrible, because otherwise they probably would have gotten kicked out, but yeah. So once he's outside, he sees other neighbors standing outside trying to calm the young woman down. That woman was, of course, Pamela Smart. She had arrived at home and found Greg lying on the floor of their entryway. She immediately ran to the neighbor's door screaming for help, telling them that her husband is passed out. Several neighbors called 911, some just reporting a hysterical woman banging on their door. But one woman who lived two condos down from the Smarts stayed with Pam and reported that the man living at condo 4E was passed out and needed medical attention. Police were the first to arrive on scene. It was only when the officer rolled Greg to his back to assess him that he noticed there was a towel under his head that had been soaking up any blood from the gunshot wound, and Greg had no pulse. 
officer. So wait, he was on his stomach when they. He was kind of like slumped over. Okay, I was gonna say because if they had shot him in the head, there should have been an exit wound in like the back of the head. That's pretty gnarly. Normally at this point. Yeah. So there was an exit wound, but they used a towel. And we'll get to what the why they used a towel. And the way he was laying, it didn't, you know, the towel soaked up much of the blood and the and he was right in the entryway and they were coming in to like his feet his were feet. first. Okay. And so and the way he was laying, it did kind of look like somebody that would have just like passed out. Like he okay. was just kind of slumped half on his side. So it's not entirely yeah, I'm with you, now. you know, so yeah. Okay. The officer attempted to place Greg back in the position he found him. Yeah, because he if he had known that he had been shot, he wouldn't have touched him. Yeah, exactly. But they actually couldn't tell that it was a gunshot wound because it kind of looked like he could have just been hit on okay. the head. Yeah. So they thought he was just knocked out, if you will, because the because of the amount of blood and they didn't actually see, like you said, like the back of the head is gonna be not it's not going to be like a clean little hole like mm-hmm. it's going to be messy so the officer of course immediately calls in this is not just a man passed out he did he later testifies that the only person to greet him upon arrival was the neighbor who had called 911 the woman who was with Pam He also reported that he did notice Pam Smart was outside being comforted by neighbors, but at no time did she approach the officers or the scene. Take that for whatever you will. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe we're just different people, but I would have been all up in their business. mm -hmm. So, and this officer, he arrived first. Once he called it in and more police officers like the detectives and stuff show up, He actually was the one to stand outside the door and sort of like secure and, you know, make sure nobody comes in that's not supposed to come in. So he saw her. He was watching. At no time did she approach him or anybody else. When Greg's parents arrived on the scene, Pam overhears officers telling them that Greg is dead. The detectives on the case arrived and initially find that the house has been ransacked. Okay. Of course, they might be led to believe that it was an interrupted burglary, except the only thing missing was a little bit of jewelry. It had all taken place at a time that would be unusual for a break-in, like around the time people were getting home from work. Greg's wallet and wedding ring were untouched, and there was no forced entry. Mm, what's going on? Yeah. Doesn't sound like a robbery. They found that the back door to the deck had been left, o- was open. Mm-hmm. Like they probably Came escaped out in- that okay. way. And that the bulkhead doors to the basement were unlocked. Do you know what bulkhead doors are? Because I didn't know the name of them. Yeah. Are they the, like the Wizard of Oz kind of yes. doors? Yes, exactly. Like the. The the ones that you the can't storm. see me, but when she said, "Do you know what they are?" I like opened the door, you know, because they're like in front of you on the ground, and you on the pick ground, them up and, and yeah. yeah, and it goes down into, into the, the basement. Okay. In this case, it go, it went into their basement. But they're the doors from the Wizard of Oz that they go in during the tornado. That yes, Dorothy doesn't make it into. Well, does she make it into the? She does. No, she got like hit on the head. Hit something. Anyway, yeah. we need to watch the Wizard of Oz again. <laughs> For monkeys are scary. Um, (laughs) so detectives begin to search for anything of Greg's that might lead them to why someone would want to kill them, kill him. Sorry. All they found was a joint in his truck. And when questioning neighbors, they found that the couple party, like I said, the couple party quite a bit. It was suspected that Greg may be involved in more than just smoking the occasional joint. Now. Hours after the first officer arrived on scene and investigators are working through the night to process the scene and get witness statements, Pam's friend approaches an officer on behalf of Pam (laughs) 
Okay. Stating that Pam is wondering why they haven't interviewed her yet and requesting that they speak with her. Uh, I'm just going to let that sit with you for a moment. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to think like maybe like was she hysterical? And so her friend was like, well, I'll go talk to him. Well, I mean, that night she was at some point, but hours later, I don't know that she was. There's no reference as to like it was very hysterical at first, but then there was no reference to it. she seemed very like, yeah, she, like calmed she calmed down. down a little. So Okay, so that's just a little off. So yes, of course. They're like, we'll talk of course we're gonna talk to her. Wait your turn. Pam told investigators that she last spoke with Greg around three PM that day when she reminded him that she had a meeting that evening and would be staying through the entirety because she was the last presenter on the agenda. Yeah. She said she got home around 1030 and thought it was unusual that the lights were out since Greg's truck was there. Pam claimed that when she walked in the door, saw him on the floor, and then saw that the place had been ransacked, she thought he j- he was just knocked out and that she left because she thought the intruder might still be in the house. Okay. In her defense, that's what I would do, too. Like, my dad has trained me. Like, you get out. I would have I would have left and called 911 as well. I mean, I, well, I might have checked on him first. I don't think I could leave Nicholas just laying in the floor. Because, like, no, I couldn't have left him. I, I would have had to go in see, and be Your like, emotions take it. You've had training, but your emotions take over. So, I, and, I couldn't and the, just leave him, though. Yeah, He's my baby. Exactly. So she also tells them she doesn't know why anyone would hurt Greg and that they had no money problems, nor did Greg have any connections to drugs or, like, drug dealings. They could not tell what caused the wound on Greg's head. So despite questioning the seemingly staged scene, they waited for the autopsy report before treating it as a premeditated murder. They were still kind of treating it like, well, maybe it was a burglary. Well, yeah, because how are they supposed to know other than... Right. Of course, as soon as the autopsy confirmed it was a gunshot wound, detectives dug into following the leads that, you know, witnesses or neighbors and people had given to try and find possible motives. They still weren't sure. Despite what Pam said, though, about no drug deals, detectives followed a trail to Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta City, no, Atlantic City. (laughs) where Greg regularly took trips to party and gamble. Woot woot. Turned out to be a dead end, though. Oh. They found no wah, wah. E- no evidence. <laughs> yeah. They found no evidence of any debt that he owed to, like, you know, gambling people, no drug dealings, nothing. Dead end. No bookies. No. He did go and gamble, but he never got in over his head. Mm-hmm. As it would be in any small town, the media is all over the case already. The murder of a young husband who seemingly had it all is certainly intriguing to most of the public, right? Major issues with this attention arose when Pam went against the Dairy PD's advice and did an interview with a local TV news reporter named Bill Spencer. I knew that's what was going to happen. It's giving Diane Downs. I'm going to go run make for it. her money. Yeah. yeah. She says, oh, me? Well, I'm just too distraught to talk. Yeah. But then I will. <laughs> then I will. everything. The first issue with this is that Pamela and Bill Spencer have conflicting stories on how it even happened. Spencer claims that Pam contacted him saying she wanted to clear up the misconception that murder that the murder was a drug deal gone bad and that she only trusted him because he was the only reporter who didn't already make that claim. Okay. Pam denies this. She says that he continuously called her at her parents' house asking for an interview and telling her she's the only one who can clear up the rumor that it was drug related. On one hand, I'm like why would he lie? On the other hand, he was a young journalist, reporter, trying to make a name for himself. Like, yeah. a lot of people do question. Well, and her story his, does sound plausible. Yeah. And you will find that throughout this entire thing. 
and I'll kind of talk about it. I kind of saved it for the end, but you will find that much of Pam's behavior and much of the what evidence they could get makes her look guilty. But it, on the other hand, like you could yeah. see how it could just look that way, but not actually be yeah. that way. So it this is a tough case in that respect. So however it came to be, Pam met with Spencer and his TV crew just three days after Greg's funeral. Spencer noted how impeccable Pam looked for a grieving widow and how she began offering suggestions on how to shoot the interview, including adding a shot of her pulling out her wedding cake that was saved for her, her first anniversary. I don't know. Do people still do that? Uh, yeah, my friends okay. who are married have done it. I don't plan on doing it because it kind of grosses me out. Yeah, I did it. If you're very careful, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, but I've also known people who tried to do it, but they just didn't like wrap it good enough, or yeah, or like, or something happened where their freezer kind of crapped out, well, and then they I, had to toss yeah. it. I saw somebody on TikTok who, instead of doing that, they just in on their first anniversary, they, they tried to recreate their wedding cake themselves and just like bake it top. together, and I thought that was cute. That's cute. Yeah. Yeah. Anywho, I didn't know if that was still a thing or not. So, you know, he said it was as if she was trying to produce the piece herself. Like, she's hmm. making all these suggestions. This is another thing. Yes, that's weird. But is it? But is it? Because given her background in the media and her aspirations to be a reporter, to me, it, no. it might be considered distasteful, but it's not surprising. Yeah. Like, she has, that's what she did for a living. That's what she aspired to do. So, eh. Yeah, I don't... Okay. Yeah. If this is going to be the whole case, it's making my tummy hurt. It's, it's wishy-washy. It's a frustrating <laughs> case. Yeah, it is. So, Pam went on to do several more interviews after that one, and detectives began to notice a pattern. The interviews always seem to focus on Pam's life and how she will move on but never any pleas for help or information as to who might have killed Greg. Hmm. Okay. That is weird. Mm -hmm. That is weird because I'm just, if I was in this situation, first of all, if Nicholas ever died, I would just die. be alone he would just with my dogs. And yeah. Die. <laughs> I, I would be alone. I Yeah. I couldn't do, no. So I can't imagine being like, I'll just move on. Yeah, I would be like, no, I'm dying. Somebody give me answers. My yes. dogs miss their dad. So the detectives, being frustrated, also noticed that Pan, Pam, not Pan, Pam, <laughs> began to reveal details of the crime during interviews. So they had to make the decision to no longer inform her yeah. of anything on the case. No leads, no evidence, nothing. Pam later claimed that she opened up about everything to the media because she didn't have anything to hide, so she didn't think she needed to be cautious about what she said. Now, that to me is sus because you want to be a reporter, but you don't understand that it's an open investigation and you shouldn't be releasing any details about it. I guess that begs the question, like, how educated are reporters on the investigation process and the discovery process. I would assume that they are, if that's what... I mean... The, I don't know. I'm thinking of, like, the crossover between, like, our work and how much we know about police work. And, like, I had to take a criminal class mm -hmm. and, like, that sort of thing. And so I can't imagine that if you're working around crime, you wouldn't know Yeah, I would think go. just to get your degree in journalism communications whatever i would think that at some point you take a class that kind of covers that that talks about if you're going to cut cover crime cover crime yeah. or whatever i would think that Somebody would be kind of know. a standard like if you have a journalism degree or yeah. you're a reporter please tell us like what that crossover is because i would think that you would know better than to yes. just start airing out information yeah especially if it's an active investigation one would think. But I guess maybe, but maybe they not. Don't. Who knows? Somebody tell us. And she was young. I mean, keep in mind she 
she didn't have a ton of experience at this point she's 22 years old yeah she had just graduated college the year prior so maybe not but it is questionable they also noticed that she definitely kept pointing everyone in the direction of burglary even though investigators were not convinced it was that simple and Mm -hmm. even when they were giving her information they made that pretty evident that they were questioning things and digging into Greg's past and all of that. So they questioned, why does she keep doing that? Why does she keep trying to point at a burglary? Despite it feeling like this all must have happened over a period of months, like, that's a lot to happen. Mm -hmm. That was just the first two weeks. What? Of the investigation. Yes. She's like pulling out. She's already saying I'm going to move on and pulling out her wedding cake. Yes. For the first two weeks. Yes. (laughs) 100% yes. (laughs) Yeah. What? Mm -hmm. She's already like done. She's like, I have to. I just have to move on. I just have to move on. He died. It's been a whole two weeks. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. It's been a whole two weeks. I didn't grieve a job in as fast like you know like you yeah can't, yeah what maybe what mm-hmm. what i don't i don't feel ready to move on from that hold on a second <laughs> I'm hold not, on i need a couple of weeks to- <laughs> <laughs> i need a little bit more than two weeks um i need a couple of weeks to wrap my brain around yeah. how she <laughs> did seriously, all of that though, in two weeks seriously though that's yeah. insane she's just like well better eat this cake because he's not gonna be here he's gone I mean, would you not want to, like, save that for the moment when it is your anniversary and you're without it? Well, it was. Remember, he got killed on May 1st. Their one-year anniversary was May 7th. Oh, no, I missed that. I'm sorry. Well, I didnn't exactly say it in that order, but yes. Okay. I, I, yeah. Oh. They got married May 7th of 1989. He was killed May 1st of 1990. So, but that should still be, like, a moment where you're, like, by your, you know, like, grieving I mean, I guess I can't tell anybody how to grieve, but I don't think that you would do that on national TV two weeks after. I'm thinking it'd been like they'd been Mm -hmm. investigating it for like a month or so. Nope. Nope. Okay. I think I'm ready (laughs) to move on. Okay. So on May 14th, 14 days after Greg was killed. 14 days after her husband was shot in the head in their, in their living room of their first home together. Yes. Detectives received a call from a woman claiming that she has heard that Pam had planned Greg's murder. At this point, not shocked. Yeah. The woman worked at a local restaurant in which she said a 15-year-old co-worker had been openly talking about a woman plotting to have her husband killed and that she was involved in the planning. Let that sink in. I mean, there's, what do you say to that? Yeah. I can't say anything to that. The 15-year-old co-worker was Cecilia Pierce, a resident of the nearby suburb of Seabrook. Now, to give you, like, an idea, basically, Derry is a small town, more like middle class, upper middle yeah. class. Seabrook is kind of like the wrong side of the tracks. Ooh. Seabrook is lower income. I'm with you. I mean, just so you have kind of the gist So it would be May 21st before detectives were able to sit down with Cecilia and her mother for an interview. Cecilia revealed that she did know Pam Smart. She said that she was Pam's intern through the media program at Winnicunit High School. Cecilia said Pam was like a big sister to her and that she really looked up to her because Cecilia wanted to be a reporter someday And she was really impressed with how far Pam had already made it in the field at 22 years old. She denied knowing anything about Greg's murder, but she did reveal an unusual detail. She admitted to detectives that she had stayed over at Pam's condo the entire week before Greg's murder. What? Yes. Like, she'd just been vibing, like, she's sleeping, sure. having a sleepover? She's, she's not a teacher. See, this is where... She's just a mentor, right? It, she is staff of the school district, and she does work at the high school as well in this media program. And so she's 
not a teacher, but she's in the same position. Yeah, like, basically. She works with you're facilitating a program with these kids. You're supposed to be mentoring them. That doesn't include like spending time with them at your house. Yeah, <laughs> like and inviting she was, like, them having sleepovers over. for a week. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Uh, so okay. Not only were detectives surprised to hear this because it showed a lack of boundaries between the student-staff relationship, but they also noted that when Pam was asked for a list of individuals who may have been in the home recently so that they could distinguish the fingerprints and rule people out, Pam gave them a list that even included their water delivery guy, but did not include Cecilia. This, of course, creates more suspicion around Pam, and they begin to further question her behavior since the night of the murder. Looking back at the initial interview notes, they realize Pam seemed a lot more concerned about giving them her alibi than to finding out what happened to Greg yeah, or yeah. expressing any emotions once she was being interviewed. Like, she was real hysterical at first, and then just nothing. Was nothing. One detective also pointed out that despite the place being ransacked, most people's reaction would be to seeing a loved one passed out on the floor is to check on them. Yeah. Not to see them, see the house, and then immediately run away. They would, might look around to see if they hear any noises or like, but they're going to check on their loved one. So a few more weeks went by and Pam grew frustrated that the police were shutting her out. So she contacted Bill Spencer again and invited him to do another interview at her new condo on June 6th. So June June 6th, yep. Five weeks, you've moved out of the house. You've moved out of, like, you didn't go and just stay with, like, Friends and Most family. Most people would still be staying with their family yeah. until, like, they kind of just grieve and get yeah. through it and and then worry about, like, yeah. buying a new place later. No. Five weeks. And she had so, already like, bought it. But a she'd new already condo. bought it, which meant that she was, like, I don't know, like. Well, maybe she rented it, but still, like. I. But how. But okay. But how could she rent it and pay a mortgage? She couldn't. She- I don't know. They might have been renting their okay, condo. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not sure of those details. Okay. Well, either way, that's bonkers. The other way, she may have been able to afford it. We'll get to oh, it. Oh, Lord. Okay. Yeah. So, despite not knowing what was happening in the investigation, she tells Spencer that they're, they're following many leads, but they're just not going anywhere. She had no idea what was going on in the investigation, yeah, they yet she was still anything. reporting. She's still doing interviews as if she knew. Just four days after her second interview with him, on June 10th, 1990, a man named Vance Latamy walked into the Seabrook Police Department asking to show them something. Vance told officers that a friend of his son named Ralph Welch, who had been staying with them at the time, came to him with the claim that he believed Vance's gun had been used to kill the man murdered in Derry. When Vance checked his gun, or I'm sorry, when he checked his guns, his gun cabinet, Mm -hmm. he found that one of the guns was not as he left it. Vance last used the gun at a shooting range and distinctly remembered not cleaning it before putting it away but it was now squeaky clean so he said he knew he needed to give it to the police to check the gun was a 38 caliber pistol which did match the weapon used on greg smart dairy detectives immediately brought ralph welch in for an interview ralph explained that he had been staying with the latimy family for some time and that he and Vance's son, J.R., were close. He said that they also hung out with two other boys named Billy Flynn and Patrick Randall, or Pete as they called him. 
Ralph told the detectives that he was concerned because he had already been hearing rumors that his friends had been involved in the murder when Billy Flynn began bragging that he had killed the guy. When they were all together, Ralph asked them directly if they did it, and they said no, but then as soon as he left the room, he overheard them saying something about somebody else being next. Okay. So he went back into the room and told them he couldn't believe that they lied to him in order to get them to tell the whole story. So they ended up telling him, and he claimed that what they told him was that Patrick held Greg, Patrick or Pete, had had held Greg still as Billy pulled the trigger and that they did it because they were promised some money from Greg's insurance payout. When asked why Pam would want to kill her husband, Ralph said the other boys told him that she said things like, Greg loves the dog more than her, and that Greg was worth more dead than alive. So, detectives searched for the three boys Ralph named, and they found that all three of them had criminal records. Not for anything in the realm of murder, of course, because these are, I believe, at the time, the youngest one was 15, the oldest one was 17. Okay. I don't even know what to say, so we're... Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. They did find that all three go to Winnicunnet High School, the same school as Cecilia Pierce attends, and Pamela Smart works the mentor program. Interesting coinkydink. Yes. And it didn't take long for them to discover that Billy Flynn and J.R. Latimy are in the same mentor program as Cecilia Hmm. and had been working on a specific project in which Pam Smart was the facilitator. Hmm. Another interesting dink. Yes. They also confirmed that Pam had, in fact, collected... $140,000 $140,000 from Greg's life insurance policy. It's worth noting that that was very significant. Like, first of all, 140000 today doesn't sound like, but back then that was obviously more money. And he was young. Greg was 23 years old. So yeah, that's a lot. They, they were kind of like, um, that's a significant policy for someone so young. Yeah. But... That's one of those things. I don't necessarily think that she plotted that. Like, I don't think she was like, hey, Greg, let's get this insurance. He worked. That's what he did for a living. He sold insurance. So just like you having an estate plan because you work in a a law firm that does estate planning and probate. That makes sense. Like, you're 20. What 20-year-olds do their estate plan? Not many. Not many, yeah. But because of the field you work in, you take advantage yeah, of, absolutely. you know, that you know what happens should you not have an estate plan. $140,000 in 1990 is equivalent to purchasing power of $319,217 today. There you go. I was very, I just, I had, I had the, got a no bug. So. Yeah. With this information now in hand, granted it's all kind of circumstantial at this point, but... Police had enough evidence to secure both search warrants and arrest warrants for the boys and their parents' homes. Yeah, okay. I'm not, I'm not, I have no problems with this. However, word travels fast in a small town. You watch Letter Kenny, they say bad gas travels fast in a small town all the time. <laughs> Sorry if you can hear my ice clinking in my Stanley. I'm like one of those Utah moms. I got the 40 ounce Stanley. It's just, there's a lot of ice in it. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so the boys were nowhere to be found. They were hiding. Well, they're, I, I can't blame them for that. They're kids. They're scared. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, all the boys' parents were good parents. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, like, who did Vance Latimy think took his gun and shot somebody? Like, he, he yeah, had to no, have known yeah. that his kid was involved, but he did the right thing, and yeah. he immediately took the gun in. All of their parents convinced them, somehow found them or got a hold of them and convinced them to turn themselves in. Well, yeah, they were going to lose their Xbox. 
There was no Xbox. <laughs> Oh, this I guess like, this is 1990. Maybe, maybe a regular Nintendo, but these are all kids from like low income families. So, okay, well, they probably the didn't even joke have Nintendo. Still landed. Okay. okay, I'm trying to say you're that gonna they were kids. There was nothing that they couldn't. No cell phones. No. Well, now they can't go to the roller rink. There you go. See, the joke is go. funny. It just needs to be translated correctly. <laughs> Like, obviously, they have to go turn themselves in for the murder that they committed. Otherwise, yes. they won't get to go to Sarah's party on Thursday. There you go. So. Her and parents have it catered by. They're fr- <laughs> <laughs> Again, they're from a small, <laughs> low-income I'm trying suburb. trying to make the joke funny, but it's just not working today. It's fine. It's good. We get it. So they ended up being arrested on June 11th, just the day after Vance Latimer brought the gun. So the yeah. police station. So the police are like acting quickly, especially for a small town. Okay. Now, like I said, I believe the youngest one was 15 at the time. Oldest was 17. So they're all minors. So the papers could not release their identities. Yeah. But they, of course, immediately reported it on the news in the papers that three teenage boys had been arrested or three teens had been arrested for Greg's murder. This drove Pam into a fury. She began calling all of the parents to find out if it was them. Now. What? She's using. Yeah. She's calling like. Yeah. She called all the parents. Now she claims that she called them to find out if they knew who it was. But. Girly pop. That doesn't look good. No. It doesn't look good. So she found out from Billy Flynn's mom that, yes, it was, in fact, Billy, Jr. and Pete, or Patrick, uh, that were arrested. Bill Spencer, Pam's favorite reporter, somehow saw the mugshots of the kids, and he was determined to find out who they were. So he went to the high school and... Keep in mind, again, timeline. Yeah. You could just walk into high schools at this yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say. Anybody could just walk into a high school. He didn't have to, like, have his picture taken and get a no. sticker. and There were no fencings around. Like, yeah, no, metal the doors detector. weren't locked. <laughs> like, you could just walk in. So he went down to the high school to try and track down who they were. And he said, it was super easy. <laughs> I walked in the door and there was a stand of pa- school papers right there at the door. And in the school paper was a story about the media program with their photos and names. Well, yeah, because it's, I mean, they're kids, they're at school. Yeah. So Spencer and his crew immediately go to Pam's condo. Only this time, she's not eager to talk. She refused to open the door, but Spencer said that she was visibly upset. And what they did get her saying, she said, quote, I can't comment, Bill. I really can't. I'm totally devastated by this. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. I'm totally devastated. So you you could comment all over the place yeah, before when he first got killed. But now that they found the killers, you're devastated. It's not looking good, Pam. Yeah. I mean, I guess I could see like if you were like, no. <laughs> I was going to try and say, like, if you're in shock. Sorry, my ice again. If you're sh- in shock and you're trying to, you know, cope and figure out, like, yeah, I just have to figure out what's next. I have to figure out what's next. And then they find who did it and then it sinks in. That would be different. But the only thing that makes me stop saying that is that she wasn't worried about who did it. She was wor- worried about making sure everybody knew she didn't do it. Mm-hmm. You know who that reminds me of? Never mind. I don't want to get sued, but it starts with a C, <laughs> and it ends and, and it ends with a AC. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to get sued. All right, somebody who was found not guilty by the court, <laughs> but she was found not guilty by the court. Not Pam. We'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, meanwhile, while all of that's taking place. Detectives are getting nowhere with the boys, the three boys. Like, they aren't talking. 
they're saying they're tight-lipped. So detectives realize that they will need to crack Cecilia Pierce. They call her and her mother into the station for further questioning and begin to put pressure on her, telling her that she could be charged as an accomplice if she doesn't tell the truth. She still doesn't crack at first. Interesting. She gets a, like, she left the interview. She said, I have, like, whatever practice or I have she history had, homework. <laughs> she had, well, this was during the summer. I think she had, like, swim practice or something yeah. like that. And she left the interview clearly upset, but she still wasn't talking. It wasn't until that evening that Celia was watching a news report that stated they may arrest a fourth suspect. Interesting. So she confessed everything to her mother, and her mother said, uh, you need to go talk to those detectives. Yeah. Her mother called the detectives and scheduled another interview. As it turned out, though, this is just, it's kind of a side note, because there's not a whole lot of information on his arrest. Uh, I believe that the fourth suspect was actually Raymond Fowler who was ultimately arrested and charged for helping to be a lookout and driving the getaway okay. car. So. But back to Cecilia, wanting to save herself. She shocked detectives when she spilled not only the facts that the kids were all in on the planning, but that Pam was having an affair <gasps> with Billy Flynn. Oh, ew, ew, ew. No. Nope. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Nope. 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 Yeah. Nope. <laughs> Cecilia said that the affair began while they were working on a project for the contest they entered. It was during the shooting of the commercial for that contest that they began all hanging out after school and away from school grounds where Pam and Billy began to get close. When asked how she knows they were having an affair, Cecilia said that Pam told her she was in love with Billy and that at one point she walked in on them having sex. Your face. <laughs> okay. I am going to clarify. It is still icky, but she's only 22. Right. So it's There's not, not a, like a, It's not a big age difference, okay. but it's just it's the fact It's a power that dynamic thing. It's a power dynamic, and it is still the fact that, like, we, ju we were just talking about this, that when there's age differences, there's a big difference between their uh, being, uh, let's say, let's say he's 18, yeah. okay? Let's say somebody is 18 years old. There's even a bigger difference to me between... An 18-year-old and a 28-year-old dating or being involved versus a 28-year-old and a 38-year-old. Yeah. Which like, I think everybody kind of agrees with and knows. I, You know, it's not, but uh, so, yeah. Mm, icky. I don't think everybody agrees. Well. <laughs> Based I hope, on I hope. what we just talked about before. I yeah. guess you're right. But, but I, hope, I hope everybody. But generally speaking, it's just... Uh, when you're a teenager, like literally your frontal cortex isn't even fully developed. <laughs> so yeah. you're like in your early 20s. So there is a big difference just because somebody is only, you know, a few years younger at those ages. It's I mean, she was seven. I think Billy was 15 at the time. Oh, yeah. He wasn't the older I one. He, he was the older he, one. No, no, no. Oh. He was the younger of. Oh, then that's not OK. The trio. Yeah, that's not OK. So, ew. Not that it was okay when she was 22 and he was 17, but it was like. But they're close. But they yeah. were closer. And but that's if he like was 18 and she was 23, like nobody would really think no, that much yeah. of it. I know except somebody for me who because I just don't think that people at, at that particular age, I think you're a very different person at 18 than you are at 22 or 23. So, yeah. This is a tangent. Thing. This is a tangent. We're sorry. <laughs> Getting if to, this makes it in and you made to know it through you, this, we'll move on now. Yeah, sorry. We'll just cut it off and move on because <laughs> we're very chatty today. Even we before, are. Yeah. <laughs> even before well, recording, you know. we were very chatty, so we'll just cut it off and move on. Okay. So where was I in the story? She just was having an affair yes. with a 15-year-old so boy. 22-year-old. First, first of all, wait, hold on. I'm not done yet. <laughs> a 
fifteen year old boy. You want to sleep with a fifteen year old boy? Really? Yeah. He no. doesn't. He doesn't was- wash his butt in the shower. <laughs> He has back knee. <laughs> he has back knee. He can't grow a beard. Like this he is He had like, a little bit of a stash. He had like a crust stash. I did stash. Google him. He did have a stash, but he did not have a stash when he was 15. No, that's true. He when, had a stash when, when was, they were yeah, in trial. A, like a year later. So, yeah. I'm sorry. This man can't, like, he, He's not a man. That's like, just the point. I'm going to be honest with man. you. His balls just dropped like two years ago. This is This is what you want? Yeah. Yeah. Shame. I, okay. Shame on you. You're yes. making women look bad. Okay. <laughs> so, police ask Cecilia and her mother if they will cooperate in setting up a tapped call between her and Pam so that they can get proof that Pam is involved. Cynthia's mom, you said? Well, they. C- did I Cecilia. say Cynthia? It's Cecilia. No, I think I'm just hearing Cynthia. Okay. It's not okay. you. I wouldn't be surprised if it was. <laughs> her I name is know. Cecilia. Her name is Cecilia. Yeah, they had to, of course, get her mom's permission. Yeah, she's And then a baby. get Cecilia to agree. Uh, but Pam did not take the bait on the Ooh, phone call. Dang. The, the only semi-incriminating thing that she said was that she literally pointed out that either one of our phones could be tapped. <laughs> <laughs> How can she be so smart about some things and so dumb about so, others? So she said nothing. Despite the dangers and wanting to avoid it, but now this is where they were, they asked Cecilia to wear a wire and speak to Pam in person. Yeah, because it's 1990. Like, it's, they're, what are they? Yeah. They just were nervous because they're like, we're sending in a 15-year-old girl to talk to a, sus- a murder suspect. Yeah, literally. Like, ugh, that's a little scary. I honestly, like, as a mom, I would have... Her mom consents, and I probably would have to because it would have felt like, well, that's the right thing to do. And Pam didn't actually do any of the heavy lifting when it yeah. came to the murder, so it's not likely that she's and going to physically harm Cecilia. And what was Cecilia's involvement? Like, I know she was pro- like involved yeah. in part of the planning, but like, if she didn't, a little more of that comes out okay. at the trial. Yeah. So Cecilia agreed, and on July 12th, 1990, they sent Cecilia to Pam's office to speak with her. Right away, there was an issue with the tech. Because they did have the technology to, like, be listening, Mm -hmm. and but they had a problem with it. So they basically just had to cross their fingers and hope that the mini recorder on her was working was working well enough to pick everything up during the conversation i'm just going to read a few quotes okay okay and this is a big deal this is this is part of the the big conspiracy in pam's mind and her defenses strategies and everything is that the tape did not pick up the entire conversation There are bits and pieces missing that are inaudible, yada, yada, but still. But is it anything that's missing? Would any of that have changed the outcome of the case? Because that's what the appeal court's going to look for, is if that's what they're saying. Yeah. Am I getting ahead? We'll get get there. We definitely will get there. So during the conversation, Pam says, quote, if you tell the truth, you cannot change what you know, you know? If you tell the fucking truth, you're probably going to be arrested. And even if you're not arrested, you're going to have to go and you're going to have to send Bill. You're going to have to send Pete. You're going to have to send JR. And you're going to have to send me to the fucking slammer for the rest of our entire life. And unfortunately, that's the situation you're in. She goes on to say, all I know is that pretty soon JR is probably going to roll. He was supposedly only in the car. I don't know. I have no idea. And pretty soon, he's going to be like, fuck Pete and Bill. I'm not going to jail for the rest of my fucking life. So he's going to turn against them, and he's going to blame me. When Cecilia says, so he's not going to say you offered to pay him? He's going to say that you knew about it before it happened, which is the truth. Pam responds, so then I'll have to say, no, I didn't. And then they believe me or they believe JR, a 16-year-old in the slammer. 
I, that's oh mighty damning. Yeah. <laughs> like even without the rest of even without it, anything it doesn't matter to me. It's very damning. I mean, if I'm sitting on a jury and I hear that, yes. How would you not? Yeah. Like, there's no doubt that you could put in somebody's head at that point about what they're saying. Right. And the, her argument is that at that point in the conversation, she claims that she was talking about the affair, not the murder. But what? Why would they go to why, jail for the rest of their life? Why for would you say that you're all going yeah. to jail for the rest of your life? For the affair. <laughs> yeah. Only you are going to jail. And that wouldn't be for the rest of your life. Yes, you might get arrested for having an affair with a 15-year-old kid. And you just ruined your life, like your career or any chance of working at a school again. But you're not going to jail for the rest of your life yeah. for having an affair with a 15-year-old. So it's pretty damning. And of course, that was sufficient enough for the district's attorney to press charges and on august 1st 1990 pam was arrested at her office in winnicott high school as she was brought out of the school a photographer from a local paper approached and began snapping photos pam believed that the police tipped them off and that this was a sign mm -hmm. of what was to come so ta -da, she's in jail they're all in jail here we are let the circus begin. Mm. Shortly after Pam's arrest, someone anonymously leaked rather provocative photos of Pam posing on a bed in a bikini. The photos were taken with her friend, but afterwards, Pam gave the film to Billy Flynn for developing and told him to keep what he wanted. Ugh. That's so weird. This, of course, fed the media narrative of the vixen teacher. They kept calling yeah. her a teacher, and she kept getting really upset about that. She's like, I'm not a teacher. She's like, I'm not a teacher. I was the media director. I didn't just work at the high school. I worked for the media center for the school district. Like, that makes a f difference. <laughs> it <laughs> like, does make a difference because it doesn't make teachers look bad. Well, right, but I don't think she's worried about that. No, I think not, she's just I'm trying saying. to downplay. I think people think it's worse if it's a teacher. teacher yeah like you had this relationship with it but she did because she was facilitating a mentorship program so you still had that same kind of role in that boy's life of course the narrative was like the vixen teacher who coerced her student into an affair and then murder it was then that the story hit national headlines and nearly everyone had heard something about the case Due to this, the district attorney appointed Paul Maggiato to prosecute the case. Paul had recently moved to New Hampshire from Brooklyn, New York, and had plenty of experience not only on murder trials, but also with the media. Months had passed with no cooperation from the boys, so Maggiato decides to charge them as adults, which meant that instead of a few years in juvenile detention, they would be looking at as much as life without parole and even possibly the death penalty for mm -hmm. Billy Flynn. Still, they didn't talk until four months later when they were all certified as adults and the prosecution was ready to proceed. Then they said, okay, we'll talk. Let's talk a deal. Maggiato offered Billy and Patrick 40 years to life with the right to defer 12 years of the sentence upon good behavior. J.R. and Raymond, of course, received less, given that they weren't present during the murder. They were just sitting mm -hmm. outside. All of the deals were contingent upon their testimonies against Pam. So, what do they do? Of course, they take the deal. Pam hired Mark Sisti, a well-known and very experienced defense attorney, who immediately petitioned for a change of venue. There was literally... No, no way. Reason, yeah. There was no way that they were finding anybody who hadn't at least heard of, that the case existed. But Judge Douglas Gray denied defense counsel's petition. However, he approved the petition from a local TV station, WMUR, 
for a request to broadcast the court proceedings. I don't like to speak ill of judges, but, like, that's the one thing that, I don't know. There were a lot of minors in this case. For it to be broadcasted live yeah. like and that. Yeah, and their trials weren't broadcasted, just Pam's. Oh, okay. But, but they're still but testifying. But still, they're testifying, and it's just there's just no way that you're going to find a jury. And yeah, of course, the jury that they end up selecting, it took them a long time to find them. And of course, they say, no, I haven't heard anything, but it's just still hard to imagine that in a small town in a small area like that yeah. that that you would find anything so i personally think that it was kind of crappy that he did not allow it that's where like politics come into play yeah. with stuff that is just not that shouldn't exist that just shouldn't happen so new hampshire versus pamela smart would be the first trial in america history to be broadcasted live the trial began March 4th, 1991, to an onslaught of onlookers and reporters. The prosecution's opening statement was quite compelling. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> I mean, the story. Like, yeah, I mean, it, but it, it's like in your hands. Here it is. So obviously their opening statements are going to be, that's their statement of facts is going to be interesting. Yeah. And they laid their story out. Painting the boys as innocent and the virgin Billy being manipulated into committing murder. The defense's opening statement was a bit off-putting. This is my opinion. It was off-putting. Because he basically just had the strategy of simply shifting the focus to the fact that the boys actually committed the murder. Yeah. Which, okay. But he, like, borderline berated the jury throughout the opening statements to remember that they must remain impartial. They signed up to remain impartial. They said they could be impartial. To me, it was off-putting. To me, if I was a juror, yeah. I immediately would have been like, I can be impartial, but you're not making it very easy yeah. <laughs> because you're okay. So while the prosecution had many witnesses who could testify to Pam's odd behavior, choice of words, etc. Ultimately, this case was a he said, she said. Or, yeah. or rather, they said, she said. Well, yeah, because they don't have any evidence other than the gun, right? They have the gun. And confession. And they have her on tape. Mm -hmm. Those were the two main pieces of evidence. And really, the gun would tie to J.R. Latimy, who didn't even... Yeah. He didn't, he wasn't the gunman. He didn't even, he wasn't even in the house. He stayed in the car with Raymond Fowler to be a lookout. Yeah. So it is messy. It really is so circumstantial, though. Yeah. I mean, I think she did it. I mean, most of and the world did, thought yeah. she did. But it is, I can see how when you say it's like conspiracy type, like. Yeah. So she thinks that both the kids conspired against her. That's her claim. The kids conspired against her. And the DA just wanted to make a deal and wanted to nail it on somebody other than just teenagers. And so they conspired. They worked with the kids to, like, offer them that deal and then basically, like, lead them to conspire, to you know. So Well, that seems stupid, but whatever. Of course, the star witnesses in Pam's trial are the three boys, J.R., Patrick, and Billy, along with Cecilia Pierce. JR testified that they actually had to have Pam give them a ride to pick up his grandmother's car, which they used during the crime. He told the court that along that drive, as she picked them up to take them, that she discussed all the details on how they would kill Greg and explicitly told them not to use a knife because it would be too messy and ruin her white furniture. Oh, my God. Hence the reason that I think the towel was there, to not be messy. I... He also claimed that she asked their opinions on what she should do and how she should react when she finds the body. I believe he even said, like, she asked, should I go and run to the neighbors and, like, or should I just call 911? Yeah. I don't want to quote that because, I mean, yeah. the whole thing's a lot, but... Yeah, I believe it was said something to that effect. 
So it was believed by many that Jr. didn't really have a full comprehension of what was happening or that he didn't really believe they would actually murder Greg. So much so, Bill Spencer, the I believe it was Bill Spencer, the journalist, is interviewed in a documentary where he's like, J.R. Latamy is an imbecile. He, like, did not get this. Yeah. Like, he didn't really comprehend yeah. the reality of the situation. But J.R. did admit that he went along with everything for Billy. And because Billy told him that Pam would give them some money from Greg's life insurance. Supposedly, Pam didn't tell him that. Just... Billy, Billy told did. him that. I note that because that's part of the conspiracy, is that oh. Pam's like, I never told them I would give them money. And nobody does say that she told them, hmm. except for Billy. Billy told the rest of the kids. So, wow. Take with that okay. what you will. Upon cross examination, JR admitted to the court that he, Billy, and Patrick had all been in the same facility and even in the same cells or in cells next to each other since their arrest. What? Yes. Oh, so they technically could have been conspiring. They could have been getting their story straight. Yep. Wow. He maintained they did not conspire. Like, he held, yeah. nope, yeah, we were in cells near each other together, yeah. but we did not conspire. And Billy Flynn takes the stand. Billy explained to the court that he had always been forthcoming about his attraction to Pam, but that the relationship only started in February of 1990 when Pam gave Cecilia a note to pass to him. The note asked if he thought about her because she had feelings for him and thought about him often. He claimed that the relationship became physical during a video shoot for the project they were working on, when she leaned over and said, aren't you ever going to kiss me? Through to the prosecution's claim, he said this was the first time he'd ever made out with a girl. Only you're not making out with a girl, you're making out with a woman. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't even know what to say. I'm so uncomfortable. He went on. Oh, you're about to get more uncomfortable. <laughs> you guys, which face. I really love, which I really love because. Of you saying, I can't believe you're not blushing. I can't believe you. <laughs> yeah, you're about to blush. Okay. <laughs> Billy went on to say that just weeks later, he lost his virginity to Pam when she invited him and Cecilia to watch the movie Nine and a Half Weeks. I know that is very much before your time. I've never seen the movie because I was like six years old when the movie came out. But even as a kid, I remember hearing about the movie later on, like when I was an older kid and how controversial it was because it was like borderline pornography, but it was a mainstream movie. Okay. And she invited two of her students students to come and watch this. And she told Billy she'd like to dance for him the way Kim Basinger uh, danced for Mickey Rorick in the movie. I'm twitching. <laughs> Oh, Billy no. said that they watched the movie and then he and Pam headed to the master bedroom where she strip teased for him and then they acted out the ice cube scene from the movie as well before having sex. And well, it's a great episode. <laughs> uh, we'll see you guys and next it, week. And, it, and all I'll say is that if you want to blush, like look up the ice cube scene. I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm going to tell you something. I will not be doing that. It's not. I mean, it's just. Yeah, no. But I don't want to think about them doing the, yeah, that. Yeah. No. Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. No. No. So, Billy told the court that the very next day was the first time Pam brought up killing Greg, saying that if he wants to be with her, then Greg has to die. No, he doesn't. There's a, a fancy thing called a divorce. Mm. Yeah, and that's what he <laughs> says. He claimed that he didn't know what to think at first, but did ask why she didn't just get divorced, to which she said she couldn't because she would lose everything. Okay, but then maybe, like, don't have an affair with a 15-year-old. Mm -hmm. Billy maintained that Pam planned everything from the beginning, down to when, how to stage the burglary, what jewelry to steal, to put the dog in the basement. They had a dog, and she told him, put the dog in the basement so she doesn't have to witness <laughs> what's happening. Well, that I can, that's nice. Um, To use a gun, not a knife, 
to helping them get the car to pick up the grandmother's car, and finally being the one to leave the bulkhead door unlocked so they could sneak in undetected. She didn't really think that whole fourth century thing through, though, because... Yeah, why wouldn't you? If want that it to hadn't be? been the case, I think if if there had been forced entry, I they honestly may have gotten away with it. Yeah, because I don't know that the police would have, other than the gun. Yeah, that's, that's really true. what did it was the gun, right? But the thing, but the thing is, is that yeah, if they had found the weapon, but if the kids had kept their mouth shut, if there had been forced entry. Vance Latimy may have never even really noticed, or he might have thought it was weird, but he might have talked to his kids and been like, did somebody shoot my gun? And they could have lied and said, well, yeah, we, sorry, we just went, like, practice shooting or something. They could, so if just a few things had been in a different order or a different place, they probably totally would have gotten away with it. But that wasn't the case. So... Billy's on the stand, and through tears, he was borderline sobbing. He detailed the moments leading up to the shooting, stating that they went through the bulkhead doors into the condo, rifled through the house to make it look like a burglary, only taking the specific jewelry that Pam told them to, and then they waited for Greg to come home. He barely got out that the last words Greg Smart heard was him saying, God forgive me. Before he shot him. Because he's a 15-year-old kid and, like, obviously he's old enough to know he shouldn't have ever killed somebody. Like, that's absolutely Clearly. the truth. But yeah. he, like, but he's 15. He does- yeah, like I said, your frontal cortex no, isn't even like, fully formed. Just- You're not capable. And he's being taken advantage of because he's having an affair with an older woman. Yeah. The defense team remained steadfast with the conspiracy defense, but Cecilia Pierce was not locked up. So what how could she, she yeah. how could she be saying all the same things as these kids, as these boys, if really they only conspired, like really they conspired once they were able to make a plea deal and the prosecution yeah, is like. Yeah, but all four of them were there and she wasn't there. Like yeah. the other two were in the car and two were inside. Right. She wasn't but present she wasn't during present the murder. All. Right. So then it, that. So, but here's the thing. She is able to corroborate yeah much of what the boys are saying as far as the planning goes so i guess the question goes what constitutes conspiracy i don't know like her talking about it with them did she realize the intent was to be for real or did she think it was like a joke or oh oh, we're gonna gonna get get there we're gonna get there so cecilia takes the stand And she essentially told the court that she was the conduit between Pam and Billy. She confirmed that Pam did give her the note to give to Billy and that it did ask if he liked her and thought about her. Cecilia admitted that she was present for many of the discussions that Pam and Billy had about killing Greg. But she said that while she thought Pam was serious, she didn't really think Billy or any of his friends would go through with it. Cecilia also admitted that she only talked to detectives because she thought she was going to get in trouble, too. So she's honest about, I was scared. I really did only talk to them because I thought I would get in trouble, too. Upon cross-examination, defense counsel attempted to discredit Cecilia as they had forced her to address that she had been doing TV interviews as well. So once it came out that she was going to be a witness places you know journalists start asking and she did it now to me i don't put i wouldn't put that on her i would put that on her parents i was just gonna say because like they had to get parental, par- parental permission and to me if i if my kid was involved in something like this i absolutely be like no you're not talking to the media like no leave my kid alone yeah so eh. it was a different era yeah. There wasn't Twitter to, like, tear your kid apart, you know? Yeah. So maybe you wouldn't have cared because at the time there was really, I mean, yeah, there weren't many repercussions for being on TV. Well, she got some, she did, some repercussions. But-, but defense also got her to admit that she at one time had attempted to assist in finding a gun. 
But she told the court that she really didn't believe any of the boys would go through with it and that she was just kind of going along with stuff because they were her friends. And she basically, in her words, as an adult, when she's being interviewed, her words were, I just wanted to be part of the conversation. Yeah. But basically, that's you didn't want to be left out. Yeah. That's a really terrible <laughs> case of FOMO. Yeah, that's bad. Like... You want to miss out on yeah, planning murder. murders. <laughs> Don't generally get crime kids. is something that's okay to miss out on. Yes, absolutely. So next, the prosecution introduced the recording of Pam and Cecilia's conversation. You know, the one where Cecilia says, "But what am I supposed to do?" And Pam says, "If you don't lie." They'll send us all to the slammer. I love that she calls it the slammer. Not the slammer. It would be a fair assumption that this evidence sealed Pam's fate, but that was just the prosecution's case. Maybe the defense, like, as you're watching the trial, you think maybe the defense has a trick up their sleeve. Do they? Well, Mark Sisti's first goal was to remove the notion that Pam was an unfeeling ice princess that the media portrayed her as. This might have been easier to do had she not been utterly emotionless every day through the trial. Yeah. But they call Pam's longtime friend, Sonia, to the stand, who testified that Pam and Greg were always very much in love. And none of this was in Pam's character because she was a kind and loving friend. However. Okay. On cross-examination, Maggiano brutally... Blew everything she said out of the water when he questioned her on her knowledge of Pam's affair with Billy. Sonia admitted that Pam had not told her about the affair until just six weeks before the trial. Oh my gosh. Not six weeks like Mm -mm. after he died. After it happened. No. Six weeks before before the trial. Before the trial. When she was, when it was about to come out and she was like, well, I might as well just get above this. Yes. Sonia was absolutely baffled and did not know what to say when Maggiato asked how she could possibly credibly testify to Pam's character when Pam clearly kept secrets from her. And this poor woman, you do feel bad for her because she's just trying to help her friend. Yeah. And she was like in tears. She didn't know. You could. You, well, you can't prepare for cross-examination. Yeah. Yeah. It was hard to watch. So this also blew... The defense tactic of, well, we'll get all her friends up there to speak to her yeah. credibility, you know, or to speak to Pam's character. So Mark Sisti had to decide against calling any other friends to the stand. He just nixed it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of fair because if you keep putting them up there and they keep getting destroyed, it's just going to make you look worse. Yes. So you got to just pick your battles, I guess. Mm hmm. The only option left was to hope that Pam could defend herself and that the jury would believe her. They put her on the stand? Over the four teens. Did they actually put her on the stand to testify? Yes, they (gasps) did. Oh, I feel like that was a mistake. Pam spent three days on the stand. Three days in court time is different than three days in regular people time. I feel like we should talk about that. I don't think we've ever mentioned that. It is still very draining and hard, but it's not like three... It's not nine three hour full days. days. Yeah. It's like, you know, yeah. three hours recess. A few through, hours, you know? yeah. So I believe based on all of my sources, okay, but like I said, there's so much information out there about this case. Yeah. Like I could have missed something, but I believe that this was the first time ever that Pam told anyone that just a few months before she began the affair with Billy, Greg didn't come home one night. Mm. And when he did come home in the morning, he confessed that he had been with someone else. Convenient timing that this is coming out. But this is another thing that maybe, like, that could have very well happened. Yeah. She might not be lying about that. But who knows? Because you didn't choose to tell anybody about it. So no one knows. Girl, you didn't tell your best friend that your husband was cheating on you? Really? Like, that's the first person I'm... Yeah. Yeah. She claimed that this was why she was susceptible to Billy's advances and that it was him who instigated the relationship. 
She said that from the beginning, Cecilia had told her that Billy had a crush on her and that she had no interest in Billy at first, but as they worked together on the project, she began to like him. She admitted that they did watch nine and a half weeks and then had sex, but she said that Billy seemed to be having a hard time knowing where reality started and the movie ended because they did not reenact the ice cube scene. Yeah, that's the line she's going to defend. As if that's the important part. Yeah. (laughs) Possibly most importantly, she claimed that she had broken off the affair with Billy days before the murder. She claimed that she told Billy the reason she couldn't divorce Greg was because she still loved him. Okay. When cross-examined, Pam excused away her conversation with Cecilia with the claim that she was actually pretending to know more about the murder, hoping Cecilia would give her more information because the police had stopped telling her anything. I was just lying. She said she understood that it was irrational, but that at the time she was desperate and trying to find out anything she could to take it to the police and solve the case. Ma'am, you're under oath. (laughs) (laughs) Quit committing perjury. Quit lying. Yeah, <laughs> I I have tried very hard to like stay impartial and to consider both sides, but it's just it's very difficult. Yeah. Now I'm gonna interject for a second and kind of flash forward to the documentary. So one of her friends that did not get called to the stand because they were their strategy was blown out of the water. Her friend Tracy claims in an interview much like that was just done a few years ago, that the doctor had prescribed Pam Prozac at the time and that it would give her manic episodes so she wasn't acting in her her best judgment and that Pam had told her that she wanted to speak with Cecilia and pretend to know more so Cecilia would possibly open up and tell her what happened. But my issue with this is that it's not done on the stand. Like, you were never called to the stand, and if you had that information and that was going to be part of your testimony... Yeah, why wouldn't they have... They why put wouldn't he have called you to the stand Yeah, to say all of that? To yeah. say, listen, doctor prescribed Prozac, and that's what makes her, like, emotionless half the time and then acting irrational half the time. You, you could have been, like, yeah. trying to corroborate. Yes, she told me in advance that she was going to try to talk to Celia and act all this out and I told her it's a bad idea or whatever you know why wouldn't defense counsel call you then yeah like, considering they were making generally pretty smart choices with their defense you'd think that that would have been one that they would have made yeah and you're not no offense not that I'm calling you a liar but you're not on the stand so I can't yeah I can't be sure back at the trial during cross-examination Maggiano made the claim that Pam lied to police about the affair because it would have shown them that both she and Billy had possible motive. She denied it and basically said that she lied to save face because she didn't think Billy had anything to do with it, so she didn't want the affair to come out. When asked her thoughts on why Billy did it then, Pam said probably because he thought that would mean they could be together. Once again, the world watched in horror as she neglected to shed a single tear in three days of testifying. Holy crap. Everyone took notice that the kid who pulled the trigger sobbed on the stand when talking about shooting Greg. He was calm. It wasn't like he got up there and it was overdramatic. No, he just cried when he actually started talking about shooting him. And then he calmed back down. It felt... Genuine. Genuine. Yeah. So, with less than three days of deliberation, the jury found Pamela Smart guilty of all charges, which included accomplice to first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and witness tampering. Just moments after the verdict was read, Judge Gray sentenced Pam to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He wasn't messing. No, he was not. Of course, the first thing the defense counsel did was petition for a retrial in a different venue, citing that she did not receive a fair trial because of the media attention and that the judges, (laughs) this I didn't agree with either, the judges did not sequester the jury during the trial. What? Yeah. Yeah, I could see how they might have a case on that then. You would think. Might. According to- I don't know if it would have changed anything though. I don't know because of the damning 
tape. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> like it was a slam dunk. Yeah. So according to Mark Sisti, the tape evidence was also flawed because it was such poor quality. And while jurors were instructed to use the recording itself, the transcripts were inaccurate. And Sisti holds that it's human nature to recall what was highlighted in the transcript rather than solely on the recording. Fair. I believe that. I believe probably everybody got out headphones. Mm -hmm. They listened to it in the courtroom. But then when they're deliberating or, re, you know, reevaluating, they probably just grabbed the transcript and had that in front of them. They probably didn't all sit there listening to yeah. it over and over. So there's probably truth to that. Pam has maintained her innocence for the past 31 years and has appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. But no one has been willing to hear her case. So. This leaves her with no recourse unless they find further evidence in her favor or for the governor to commute the sentence to something less. Yeah. Pam's defense team was denied a commutation hearing in 2019, but they tried again this past year when the news broke that the prosecutor, Maggiato, had tried a case in the 80s that was recently overturned due to the use of a witness who had a mental health disorder that had not been disclosed to the court. So, okay, but how does that have anything? I mean, like, I know how that do, they're going to try right. and use it, but does it really have right. anything? No. So basically, Pam's mother in an interview said, it is unlikely that Maggiato's misconduct began and ended with Pam's case alone. So that's the angle that they're going for. Yeah. But it was determined that nothing about Maggiato's conduct would have changed the outcome of Pam's conviction, and their request was once again denied. All of the boys, now men, served their sentences and were released uh, at various times, I think. Yeah. Some of them, the lookout guys, were, like, released back in, I want to say, like, 2005. And then I believe Billy Flynn and Patrick Randall were released sometime, like, in the mid-2000s or, like, 2015, maybe. Mm -hmm. That just made, you know, so when they were released, especially when Billy Flynn was released... It brought up a lot of, like, Pam's supporters saying, like, why should she spend the rest of her life in jail when you actually committed the murder and now you're out? Intent. But intent and the fact that they were kids. And yeah. I have I no know. problem with I have no problem with that. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like to me, Billy and Pete, who did the most of the crime, served basically a life sentence is 25 years in most places. So yeah. if they were sentenced in 1990 and then they yeah, got they out did. in the mid, you know, that sounds like yeah. they did their time. Because they and were offered the 40 years minus 12 for good behavior. Yeah. So, and they weren't. And it, but that's they're not going to reoffend either. No. Billy Flynn, he met somebody. That's so crazy to me. That whole world of like meeting prisoners, and meeting getting prisoners and getting married oh stuff. Maybe we'll talk about that. I one just day. don't like, like how what. Although, I mean, I guess if you met somebody in, like, in a situation like that, well, yeah, I killed this guy when I was 15, but I was coerced and yada, yada. Yeah, yeah. Then you, you might be more open to, like, well, you're not a monster. <laughs> yeah. We can get past this. Of course, Pam's supporters believe her narrative of the I was conspired against. Pam argues that the boys did so to save themselves from the death penalty and that Cecilia did so to possibly get famous or that she possibly had a crush on Billy. Bro, what in the world? But Cecilia came out for the first time in many years and did one of the documentaries. And she still, as an adult, is like, you know, she did this. <laughs> like, yeah. I th that's my story and I was young and maybe I shouldn't have done the interviews but I did and yeah. I just I was telling the truth so Pam claims that she has spent years trying to find out who provided the transcripts of the tape but the attorney general's office claims they do not know and then during one of the documentaries Maggiato the prosecutor was asked who do you know who did the transcripts yeah. And he said he believed it was someone at the attorney general's office. But so, like, even if the transcripts were slightly altered, it doesn't change the content. Yeah. And the portions that I quoted, yeah. you could clearly make those portions yeah, out. Like, not... it wasn't 
questionable None in of this my mind. Is changing the outcome of the case. So I do want to mention if you want more on like kind of the conspiracy side of it, the it'll be in the sources. I list both documentaries that I watched. The documentary Captivated is the one that kind of views everything more from the conspiracy and the yeah. defense side. And it was interesting to me because it also opened the door to the question, should juries be informed of potential sentencing of a defendant? Because I don't think a lot of people know that. I don't think a lot of people realize that when you go for jury duty and you have this case, you're not told what the potential sentencing is prior to making the decision guilty, not guilty. Unless it's a death penalty case. True. And sometimes they're told because it sometimes is jury deliberated whether or not they will be getting the death penalty, depending on the state. Right. But other than that. Other than that, they don't know. They don't know. And so in this documentary, one juror at Pam's trial had been doing audio recordings of herself each day after court to kind of keep track of like what happened yeah. throughout and what her thoughts were at the time. So that way, when it was time to deliberate, she could kind of that makes sense. feel like refresh her memory. They have those tapes. That documentary uses those tapes and plays them for you, or at least obviously sections, not like the entire tapes. But she said that her and two other jurors were not entirely convinced of Pam's guilt, but that it was difficult to argue otherwise after the recording came out yeah. of Pam talking to Cecilia. But she kind of sounded devastated because once the sentence was handed down, she says in her audio recording for her personal use, she said... If we had been informed that Pam was looking at life with no parole, she felt that they would have spent more time deliberating and they and that her and the two other jurors that weren't entirely convinced would have been a lot more likely to put up more of a debate because they did not expect such a sentence, given that she okay. wasn't the one that actually murdered him. I have mixed feelings on that. Like, yeah, part of me thinks, well, if it affects the way that you objectively see the case. True. Which is why I think they don't do you it. You shouldn't know. Because yeah. if, if you're saying, if she's saying that knowing would have changed the way that they deliberated, right. not the way that they came out, but the way that they deliberated alone, I can totally understand why they don't tell them. Right. And I think that's why they don't. Yeah. It's because they don't want people... Doing one way or the other. Either you you personally find them guilty, but some people don't. But because you do, you're like, oh, yeah, I want them to get the life sentence, you know, so you fight even harder mm -hmm. or vice versa in a situation like this where you were like, if not for this one piece of evidence, yeah. I wouldn't think she was guilty. But knowing that she was going to get a life sentence, you're feeling guilty mm -hmm. over sending somebody to jail for this. Exactly. Not everybody can be objective. Like exactly. That. Like, not, so, you know, some of us are more emotional. Like, I cry at everything. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a pretty emotional person, so I yes. don't know if I knew a life sentence if I if I could objectively be, like, okay yeah. with, sen like, with saying guilty. So, I, I mean, it's... Yeah. No, I just thought it was interesting because... I guess I never really thought about that. Like, I knew either. that that was the case, that people aren't jurors are not told, but I didn't really put that much thought into it until I saw that and I thought, oh, that's a fascinating debate on should they be informed? Should they not? Yeah. The only thing I've ever thought about in relation to that is with um, juries deciding whether or not the death penalty is allowed or on the table at all. Yeah, that sometimes bothers me because I'm like, mm, this is a jury of your peers. They're like innocent people that shouldn't be making a decision about a human life. Yeah, but I understand that they want it to be deliberated on whether or not the general public thinks that that's a fair. Yeah, so I get it from both sides. Yeah. So anyway, there you go. There's a. I mean, I did my best, but I didn't want to spend two and three no, episodes think, on I this. Think, yeah, I think um, you did a good job consolidating. But I mean, I don't know lot. everything, but I I feel I feel well informed. Yeah, there's a lot to it, and there's a lot of perspectives, and there's a lot of, like I said, Pam believes people conspired. Yeah. She has stuck with it, and she's, a lot of people are saying she's been a model prisoner. She's gone on to get, like, two master's degrees. 
Or is she just lying so long that she believes and, it herself? Yeah, I don't know. Because it is very difficult. Because if you're the type of person that just goes like on your gut with how people are, she kind of earned that ice princess title. Mm-hmm. She does not come across as a very emotional person in general. So it is easy yeah. to just be like, eh, you're guilty because you didn't get emotional. But at the same time, like. Well, now I want to go watch part of the court trial just to kind of see her demeanor. I might do that because that's interesting. You should. Yeah. I recommend it. CourtTV.com. CourtTV.com. <laughs> well, if you guys made it all the way to the end here, this is a long one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's like an hour. We've recorded for an hour and a half. Holy crap. Um, But I know that some of that's going to be cut because we were on tangents. But if you made it all the way to the end. Good thank job. you. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, thank you. Let thank us know you. what you think. Do you yes. think it was conspiracy? Do you think that she did it? I think she did it. I mean, I lean towards she did it, but I can see how people buy into the conspiracy. Yeah. So. Well, I think you did an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry to make it so long. Oh, no. Sometimes it's nice to have a long one. If you've got a long drive, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you. That's and so. um, I hope you guys have a fabulous week. And we'll see you next week. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Burden of Proof Pod and email us at burdenofproofpod at gmail.com.